I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, Francisco, Michelle, and John, for the invitation. In fact, when I, when I got the invitation, first came to mind was, how can I relate what we are doing on RNA virus evolution, quasi-species dynamics, adaptability, with these concepts of clonality that Michelle and Francisco had really put forward um, very clearly with uh, uh, parasites, for eukaryotic parasites. So, I did a little bit of reading, and the final result has been the presentation that I, uh, I will show you now. And so the talk is divided in several parts that I, uh, they, they are uh, relatively connected. Introduction to the world of viruses, mechanisms, and levels of virus genome variation, because I thought many people here are not familiar with viruses and virology, so I will introduce them. Quasi species as an evolutionary dynamics with emphasis on mutation, impact of negative selection, virus population complexity and clonality. And I was intrigued by the concept of starving sex, and I will introduce also inconsequential sex uh, for viruses. Predominant clonal evolution in viruses, that's a concept that uh, Francisco and Michel have put forward very clearly in the literature. So I'll uh, you'll see that there are things in favor of this in virus evolution, others that do not fit exactly the same picture, uh, because there are factors that favor and factors that limit mixed infections, which is a consequence uh, or, or a necessity for recombination to occur. Uh, I will talk about adaptive mechanisms in absence of recombination. That goes now towards the work that we do in, in my laboratory, strategies to control viral disease, and finally, some conclusions. So I have depicted viruses here as spheres. It's a big simplification. Viruses change in shape, in size. Let's say average diameter would be from 30 to 300 nanometers. And I have indicated genetic material of different forms that we have. Linear, circular, diploid RNA in some retroviruses three different genome segments in one particle, or particles that you need two, each one with a different genome segment to co-infect the same cells. And this can be DNA, RNA, double-stranded, single-stranded. There are 10 to the 8 virus particles in one milliliter of seawater. So students beware when you go to the beach here to swim. 10 to the 31 to 10 to 32 viral particles in the biosphere, which is equivalent to 200 million tons of carbon, 10 times more viruses particles than cells. You may ask, how do you know that? These are metagenomic studies, and they have estimated also that there are 10 to the uh, uh, 23 infections per second in our biosphere. There is continuous lineage diversification, but phylogenetic groups can be defined. So that's a, a, a kind of support for a, 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 at least part of the clonality concept. How do viruses multiply? This is, of course, a very simplified picture. Each virus group would have a book with details on how multiplication goes on. But I would like to just say that viruses normally recognize on the cell surface a receptor, except for plant viruses that do not use a specific receptors. They entry into the cell. They have to release the genome in what is called particle uncoating. That genome expresses proteins that, together with cellular structures and cellular proteins, give rise to the genome replication. And from a single genome entering the cell, multiple genomes are produced. And even at that stage of replication, you already have variation at the molecular level. So you have mutations here, as I will mention in, in, in a second, so that this collection of progeny genomes that may be 10, 100, or 10,000, they are already different. Then viral structural proteins encapsidate these RNAs or DNAs. They exit the cell, sometimes taking up some membrane material, but that's not a condition. There are viruses that do have membranes and other viruses that do not have membranes and you produce progeny virus. So intracellular replication complexes where this takes place are the first line of genome diversification in viruses. 
recombination, which is in a, an important point regarding clonality, has two major mechanisms in virus. One, this is the usual one, replicative recombination. And replicative combination means that when an RNA template, for example, this plus strand, is copied into the complementary minus strand, it can jump templates and continue copying a different parental genome. So you get a mosaic genome, and that's a true recombinant, and that happens in several viruses. In fact, probably in most, as I will mention later. And less widespread, but also described, is what is called non-replicative recombination that does not require the viral genome to be replicating because if you have broken RNA, there are enzymes activity that can join them to give the same result of a mosaic genome. What interested me many years ago was the fact that viruses display very high mutation rates so that if an individual, this is a man, it could be a plant, it can be an insect, whatever, is infected by a single genome with a defined sequence, it rapidly develops into a collection of mutants. Each mutation is here described by a different symbol with a consensus sequence and a mutant spectrum. And that fits exactly what was predicted by quasi-species theory. It, is says, it says here, mutant spectra that we also call mutant distributions, swarms or clouds, are as predicted by the quasi-species theory of primitive replicant self-organization and adaptability that was put forward in the 1970s by Manfred Eigen and Peter Schuster. And so this is key to the adaptive properties of many viruses, in particular RNA viruses. Why? Because you have these distributions that change with time. So this is dynamic. There are already genomes here that no longer appear here. Mutations occur continuously. And this can happen without any change in the consensus sequence. And that continuous exploration of mutants is adaptive because any single symbol here can represent decreased sensitivity to a drug or to an antibody or a change in recognition of a cell type. Tropism, changing host range, and so forth and so on. So this is a kind of continuous testing by the virus of possibilities through mutation. Many years of work of many people are summarized here on what we believe, and some of these concepts will be obvious because this is Darwinian evolution applied to viruses. But let me state what we believe now, uh, things that are going on. Some are very expected, others are new. First, high mutation rates, 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 5 substitutions per nucleotide, that are about 1 million fold higher than cellular DNA normally because we know there are cases of high mutation rates also in DNA, in some types of cancer, even physiologically in the generation of immunoglobulin diversity. But I'm talking about in general. And that's due to the fact that the viral polymerases that copy RNA do not have proof reading repair activities. So the mutations that are introduced stay there. They are not substrate either for the post-replicative repair DNA repair systems that operate on, normally on DNA, at least on replicative DNA. So there is rapid genome replication, high virus turnover in infected hosts that has been documented in many cases. And then, of course, we have the principles of Darwinian evolution, reproduction with genetic variation, competition, selection, and bottleneck events, so that many populations are the result of founder events. This is not only in transmission. We are becoming more and more aware that bottleneck events are important in virus evolution, even within infected hosts. For example, in insects, that is part of the life cycle of many arboviruses, there are bottlenecks inside the insect, thereby creating populations out of one or very few founding particles. And then finally, and this is one of the points that interests me most now, is that there are intrapopulation interactions. So that these mutant distribution are not just the result of a kind of balance of mutation and selection 
In addition to that, there are interactions of complementation and interference among individual genomes and their gene products, and that gives rise to a behavior that is not necessarily the one expected from the individuals that are in the population. Interestingly, and we have seen some of this in the meeting, and we see later today in the afternoon more, there have been extensions of these concepts. There are more and more similarities with RNA viruses in some cellular communities, tumor cells, I think also some eukaryotic parasites, mutator bacteria that have 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 higher mutation rates than average, and excitingly, even recently, two prions in a completely different sense that genetic change. In prions, that concept of quasi-species-like uh, behavior relates to conformations. So prions depend on a certain conformation to be pathogenic, and there are distributions of conformations that can shift in the way that mutants can shift in RNA virus. Very interesting work uh, by Charles Wiseman and colleagues uh, over the last recent years. And I wanted to show these slides to, to tell you that we are completely aware that quasi-species has nothing of, let's say, rupture or anything very special compared to other models of mathematical models, if you wish, of Darwinian evolution. And here I have copied a paper by Page and Novak a number of years ago in which you see this important price, replicator mutated price and replicator mutator equations that I did not draw. When the emphasis is on mutations, you have quasi-species, and that is the equation, that the basic description of the change of a particular mutant concentration as a function of times, but given a quality factor that depends on the fidelity of copying and the possibility that other mutants, K, in the distribution can give rise to mutant I. And the other end of this spectrum of equations, you have Lotka, Volterra, a prey-predator relationship that ignores totally mutation. But that's part of the same concept of the Arbidian, um, evolution expressed in mathematical terms. And I have quote here this book by Okasha, on evolution and the levels of selections, because now I am very, very interested in this, in the sense that there is now this possibility of two levels of selections in viral quasi species at the individual level or at the collective level because of what I told you of interfering and complementing interactions. But anyway, all this is connected, and the merit of quasi species, in my view, is only that there is an emphasis on mutations and that concept that mutants are really mutant clouds. There is not a defined sequence. You have a cloud of mutants at any single point of time. So how do we handle in virology now this situation and what do we study? There are two big branches of knowledge as far as I can tell. One is direct study of viral populations by PCR or RT-PCR for RNA viruses that allows amplification of viral samples. And you ca we can have a consensus sequence and compare consensus sequences. And for many purposes, that's OK. That's fine. That's sufficient. That's what chemistry was uh, giving us uh, uh, years ago, just the average consensus sequence of a, a population. But now we can, and it's very important for many purposes, to go into the mutant spectrum composition, as I was mentioning. And we have two means of doing it, molecular cloning and sequencing. And now, recently, deep sequencing. And that's really creating in this field, and I am sure in other fields, a new means of penetrating into populations that really it's very exciting. I'll mention some examples in the rest, uh, the rest of my talk. And of course, then we have experimental evolution that's very important because then we can study factors that influence evolution. And we can do that when viruses can be propagated in cell culture. Not all viruses can be propagated, but many can. And one can obtain biological clones in the sense of individuals that are generated from a single initial genome. We can do repeated bottlenecks. We can produce persistent infections. We can produce cytolytic infections so that the cells are killed. And we can introduce selective pressures. So in these serial infections, one can add antibodies, one can add inhibitors, and one, and one can study what is the response of viruses to these uh, different situations. 
just to give you some examples of, um, in a schematic way, of what we do or can be done in experimental evolution of viruses, we can amplify RNAs in the test tubes, for example, see RNA evolution in vitro. This comes from the old times of Sol Spiegelman um, in New York in the 1960s, but now it can be adapted to RNA replication, RNA replicons in vitro. We can do the same with viral infections. We can infect cell monolayers or cell suspensions with a virus, and the virus progeny infect a new plate, and we can do serial infections. And to give you an example, this is a result still unpublished from my laboratory uh, in which hepatitis C virus that for the first time can be grown in cell culture. Uh, uh, last uh, five years ago, we did not have any cell culture system for an important pathogen such as hepatitis C viruses. Now we have, and thanks to a collaboration with Charles Rice of Rockefeller University, in my lab we are now doing experimental evolution with hepatitis C virus. And you see a very interesting example of 200 passages, serial passages like this of the virus, how these fluctuations keep increasing, and we are now quite interested in understanding why this is happening and so forth and so forth. In this type of design, we can have single clones, we can put populations in parallel, and we can add a selective pressure, S, whatever, an inhibitor, selective agent, and compare the control, just virus passage under a certain environment, and these passages under the same environment, but in the presence of S, a selective agent, and ask questions about how the population changes, is there any dominant mutation, and so forth and so on. So, Detailed analysis of molecular events of replicating viral populations by next generation sequencing raise the issue of the distinction between occurrence and evolutionary consequences of mutation and recombination. And I'll uh, talk about this now in a few minutes. Penetration into the mutant spectra is providing evidence of unproductive or inconsequential mutation and recombination events as well as multiple and transient, that until now they were hidden, selection episodes. And I'll give you some examples of this. One example concerns recombination. That was done, uh, it's a recent publication by the group of David Evans in the UK, working on poliovirus, and they applied for the first time next generation sequence to analyze, like looking with a magnifying glass, what is going on during recombination at the molecular level. So you have two parental viruses that can be distinguished because there are mutations that act as markers. So we can know which product is parental or which product is a mosaic recombinant. And by doing that and looking at the generation step, while recombination was taking place inside the infected cells, you extract the RNA and you look what was happening. Surprisingly, they found many transient crossover points, molecules that were recombinants, that were, if I remember correctly, more than 50 that were, they were able to diagnose by next generation sequencing. And yet, when they looked in the same population at the resolution step, only two recombinants actually took over and contributed to the next generation. This is why I wanted to tell you that I was going to discuss um, unproductive recombination, or if you want, the difference between what the machinery is ready to do and then the evolutionary outcome of a specific recombinant that that, yes, because of high fitness in that environment or whatever reason, in the resolution step, these authors found that a few recombinant molecules made their way to the next generation. Now, virus identity, nevertheless, is preserved in, 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 in nature. Virus lineages can be defined. That's obvious. There are lineages. I will show some, of, some now, but this is true of many of all the viruses that are studied phylogenetically. They generally group geographically, but grouping tends to be blurred as epidemics and pandemics progress. But that blurring means that it is because new lineages 
are introduced in the same geographical area. Not that recombination is blurring the lineages. For example, in Spain, in the south of Spain, we had typical hepatitis C subtypes. And because of immigration, now these subtypes that were typical of European subtypes, now they are being mixed with Afri African subtypes because populations are being mixed. Recombination during the AIDS epidemics was noticed only when HIV-1 can diversify extensively. I'll show you that now. Recognition of recombination requires co-infection of the same host organisms and target cells within the organism with at least two genetically distinguishable virus variants. Otherwise, you don't distinguish. You can have a lot of recombination inside the cell, as I sh showed previously for poliovirus. But if there are no markers, these are silent recombinants, of course. It may be an unlikely occurrence, because you need co-infection, further limited by superinfection exclusion mechanism. Viruses have developed, and that may be an evolutionary uh, advantage for them, have developed means to exclude a second infection when the virus has already penetrated and started using the cell resources for its own replication. So this is called superinfection exclusion, and there are several molecular mechanisms that explain it. However, there is evidence, so now the other side of the coin, that some cell subsets are prone to multiple infections. So it, that, it looks like an organ, the liver, whatever, is not just a kind of uh, open field that any cell behaves the same. In these two papers that deal with cyt cytomegalovirus and HIV, there, are, there is evidence that some cell subsets are prone to multiple infections. And that, of course, would favor recombination. What is the situation now with HIV after diversification, say, from last century, whatever you know, time was the origin? So this is a kind of summary the way things are now at the epidemiological level with HIV. This is simian immunodeficiency virus from chimpanzees that it's supposed to have entered the human population four times, at least. One gave rise to the major group of HIVs that are circulating in the world nowadays, that are divided in many subtypes. And these are very rare, some infrequent subtypes. For example, NMP are found only in some areas of Africa, specifically in Cameroon. Then. B is dominant in developed countries, and more than 90% of infections that, of course, affect many other regions of the world, uh, in fact, with more intensity than developed countries, are of the non-B types, so the other types here. The interesting thing is about recombination. Now there are about 53 recognized circulating recombination forms. This means that recombinants originated and they have de made their way to be epidemiologically relevant. If you wish, they have started new clones of HIV that are circulating in the world. But there are, I have put here the infinite sign, I don't like it, but to mean that analysis show unique recombinant forms now very frequently. And the idea is that some, but not all, these unique recombinant forms will make their way to being established recombinant forms. It's a little bit, you know, at the molecular level, many attempts at the molecular level to have lots of recombinants, and then a few are successful. So at the epidemiological level, it translates into a similar situation. Lots of attempts with recombinant forms, and only some of them, because of selection of random events, okay, make it to be circulating forms. And this is some examples of specific recombinants that people have recombinants. Nevertheless, this is, for example, retrovirus phylogeny. When you look at all these viruses, you can have a defined phylogeny. These are different types of uh, you know, retroviruses. I will not go into that. Even within a single infected individual, you can have some kind of phylogenetic tree with individual clones that I have drawn here just a few as circles, and the others are triangles. So one can, even if this, uh, of course, these trees have uh, limited uh, boot, bootstrap support, but nevertheless, you can see some uh, kind of lineage within infected individuals. 
And this, and this is, um, you know, the indication that I am uh, from Spain, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that uh, slipped into the, <laughs> into the, the slide. Uh, but what I want to show here is a different way of representing this uh, mutant clause that I was telling you, and that's called partition analysis of quasi-species. And what people do in this method is just use spheres to represent group of mutants that have the lowest genetic distance among them. And the interesting thing as a function of time is that sometimes you find a population that is um, let's say um, minority in time one, but can be prominent in time two. So these dynamics can be seen in this type of thing. Now, next generation sequencing is also revealing something that I myself find extremely interesting. And this is how many selection attempts take place while selection is, is you know, being performed. And you only see the final result. And that I have, uh, to illustrate it, I have made a distinction between direct selection, in which, for example, if you have that genome with that particular mutation represented by a red asterisk, it becomes increasingly dominant. That's fine. But now people see many. I am illustrating this only with one case. But in some of these studies, there are even tens or even hundreds attempts of selecting, for example, this green asterisk here. And while it's on the way to selection, something else happens. For example, that red asterisk, it takes over. And then that hidden selection event, it can never be seen. It was only seen because you applied next generation sequence, this magnifying glass, to selection. And these are three studies with different viruses, different selective constraints, where you can see this type that I called, uh, well, here it is written, multiple, transient, inconsequential selection events recorded by next generation sequence and analysis of viral populations subjected to specific selective constraints. So a bit of a summary and perhaps insisting on some points. Limitations of recombination in viruses. Mutant swarms introduce an ambiguity regarding recognition of the occurrence of recombination versus mutation. You need markers, more than one mutation marker, for the two parental genomes or some sort of other genetic lesion, like a deletion or something, to distinguish really recombination from mutation because you have these very high mutation rates. Recombination with consequence for evolution requires co-infection of the same cell by genetically distinguishable virus variants. Co-infection is limited by the low probability of dual infections in the field and by several mechanisms of effect and exclusion. Dual or multiple infections may be favored by cell subsets prone to uptake multiple virus particles. And we know that recombination has been important in evolution because, for example, and this is one, but there are other examples, historically, one virus that is called Western equine encephalitis virus may have a reason by recombination between a symbis like and an eastern equine encephalitis like viruses. They belong to a group of viruses that are called the toga viruses, and the molecular evidence is very strong in favor of that virus having been generated by recombination. Application of next generation sequencing may help distinguishing inconsequential molecular recombination from biologically significant recombination. And viruses appear to exploit recombination to very different extents ranging from virtually non-existent, although I will qualify that in a minute now, to what I call exuberant recombination. So what is our current view on recombination in viruses? Recombination is abundant for DNA viruses. Retroviruses and many positive strand RNA viruses, the positive strand means that the genomic RNA is of the same polarity of viral messenger RNA in terms of synthesis of proteins. Some types of DNA recombination that lead to variation in gene copy number are viewed as an adaptive strategy for complex DNA viruses replicated by, replicated by high fidelity DNA dependent DNA polymerases. Many retroviruses and positive strand RNA viruses display active recombination, as I have shown you in the examples of HIV and also a polio virus probably favored by limited RNA-dependent RNA polymerase processivity, 
which means the capacity to complete copying of the same template molecule. When the enzyme falls off the template, it's easier to find another molecule, and then you get recombination. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Negative strand RNA viruses, those whose genomic RNA is opposite polarity than viral RNA, display no recombination or limited recombination to yield viable recombinants. And that's interesting, and in virology, it's a kind of a puzzle. However, they frequently generate defective mutants, often containing internal deletions. And the best way to explain this is actually through recombination also. But it's puzzling that in nature, these minus strand RNA virus do not seem to really uh, use recombination. Still, mutation, of course, stands a universal mechanism of adaptability of RNA viruses. Now, going to the very last part of my talk, more related to, to what we do in my laboratory. Look at the time. I'm fine. Um, connections of mutations and recombination with disease and disease control, because that has been the focus of my work for, for many years now. So specific variants, mutant or recombinant, of non-pathogenic forms may produce disease. And that relates, remember, to the mutant clause. I told you there is a probability that some mutations will really change the behavior of the virus. So that has been shown very clearly that you have specific mutations that render the virus virulent. Quasi species complexity may affect disease progression or response to treatment. And that has been very elegantly shown at NIH by Patricia Farshi initially, then other people with hepatitis C virus, for example. Pre-existent or newly generated variants may be resistant to antiviral agents, and acquisition of multidrug resistance has been associated with recombination events. That's expected because if you have two genomes, one encoding resistance to one drug and the other encoding resistance to another drug, and under the pressure in the field or in the laboratory of the two drugs, you are selecting for recombinants. And that has been shown very clearly in the case of HIV. And quasi-species dynamics suggests new antiviral strategies, such as virus extinction by enhanced mutagenesis. And that's what we are doing now. And some of the strategies for viruses are interestingly connected with the strategies for cancer, as we saw yesterday, and we'll see this afternoon again. First, let me tell you an evidence that evolution is important for disease. And this is an experiment um, uh, published uh, already many years ago by the group of Julie Overbaugh here in the United States. And the experiment is very elegant and simple. You have a simian immunodeficiency virus and you infect a monkey. This is not pathogenic. Now, you take <clears throat> the virus from this monkey, clone it, in the sense of producing a clone, so you know what you are injecting, and then inject another monkey, and as expected, no disease. This virus is not pathogenic, no disease. Now, let this monkey live months with the infection. Genetic variation takes place in the virus. Now, take this clone that has already changed and do the same experiment as at the beginning. You take another monkey, now, when you inject, that virus has acquired pathogenicity, and this monkey develops a disease that is similar to AIDS. So evolution towards pathology is very well controlled in this case. There are other examples, but that's, in my view, an elegant experiment. I like this picture uh, in, 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 a, in a kind of artistic way. But also, I take advantage uh, of this, you, you recognize this is the way I want to impress people that uh, quasi-species is a reality that we have to confront in virology, okay? You need 100 million pages or pictures like that, 100 million, to represent what is in the liver at the peak of an infection with hepatitis C. That's what, so, so that's the challenge. I, I call this slide the challenge. And virologists have the obligation to deal sometimes with situations that we go from one of these individuals, bottlenecks, you know, transmission, whatever, to up to 10 to the 10, 10 to the 12, that is what is actually in the liver, in HIV infected individual. Of course, it changes. There are viruses that are not so productive and so on. 
And what we cannot do is consider that this is just this. You know, as in the textbooks 20 or 30 years ago, one virus, one sequence. So that's not the case. Complexity is a key word to understand and, in my view, to confront viruses. And these are a list of things that I said that is some overlap with cancer. Some strategies developed to overcome the adaptive potential conferred by quasi-species dynamics. Combination therapy, the big success for HIV, actually, the control to convert HIV infections in a chronic, in, in a chronic disease is highly active antiretroviral therapy for AIDS that uses combination uh, normally of three different drugs, antiretroviral agents. Splitting into an induction and a maintenance regimen. So you change drugs from an initial treatment to a second one. Targeting of cellular functions. Innate immune response stimulating drugs. Interestingly, I am now very interested in this, to do uh, combinations in, in our studies. Inhibitors of enzymes involved in pyrimidin biosynthesis, for example, seem to stimulate the immune system, the innate immune system, which is extremely exciting from the point of view of combination therapies. Combined use of immunotherapy and chemotherapy. And what we are doing in my lab, lethal mutagenesis, extinction by excess mutations, and of course I will not have the time today to go into detail. But drugs that stimulate the innate immune response or induce lethal mutagenesis, lethal mutagenesis means increase the mutation rate of the virus above a tolerable level so viral functions deteriorate. Okay? Share being broad spectrum antiviral agents, and here I put some of these drugs, a very a key, a, a key reference, recent reference, Ribavirin and Favipiravir for lethal mutagenesis, a very important new drug considered really a promising drug, and it works apparently by lethal mutagenesis. But of course, we cannot exclude that additional mechanisms may also contribute to this broad activity. Broad activity means that these are drugs and drug combinations that can uh, stop many different types of viruses, not just one. So I arrived to the end of my talk with the conclusions what I'm, uh, I have tried to, to tell you um, in relation to clonality. I don't know if, if my ideas uh, you know, have been uh, clear enough on that, but let me summarize what I have tried to say. Viruses are wide, widespread in nature, and their genetic program is encoded in diverse types of DNA and RNA genomes. Molecular mechanisms for mutation and recombination are constitutive in the replication machineries of viruses. Recombination relevant to virus evolution and to the emergence of new viral pathogens has occurred, but is limited by the requirement of at least a double infection of the same host cell. In limitations of recombination, confer a significant level of clonality in virus evolution so that viral lineages and sublineages can be defined and are the basis of virus classification. And genetic variation is a major factor in viral pathogenesis and in the difficulties for the control of viral disease. Current efforts aim at counteracting the adaptive potential of viral populations. And I want to say two things here. One is that Celia Perales, the people here, but mainly Celia Perales, who is this lady here, is now instrumental in my lab to do the work that I have not had time to summarize to you, but you have seen what we are doing. Susana Manrubia and Jaime Iranzo are helping us a lot on theoretical models for treatments, and I want to acknowledge them. Charles Rice from Rockefeller University in, in hepatitis C, Juan Carlos de la Torre in a whole lethal and antiviral treatments. I'm going to visit him now at the Scripps in this couple of days. And then we belong to a network of uh, people interested in um, vital disease of the liver, uh, and, and, and that gives us some support. I don't want to finish without saying something since Francisco is here. This picture was taken five years ago. If I had produced a picture just to come to this meeting, these 12 people here would have been six. The reason is that the support for Spanish science has dropped 40% in five years. Every time that Francisco comes to Spain, he tells the authorities that it is not possible that a country will be solid 
economically without support for science. And I want to take the advantage of this to thank you, Francisco, for your continuous uh, help to try to promote Spanish science from the point of view of public financing. I'm sorry to say you are not very successful, but I have, <laughs> but, 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 but I, I have to thank you, and I take this opportunity to thank you. So I'll be uh, happy to, to respond to questions. Thank you.